that. And so the thing I always forget to do, where is it? Oh, you know, transcript, there we go. Okay, so how many people we have? Let's give it until 10.02 and then we can get started. Let me make sure I have everything up and running. So, okay, yeah, looks like we're good to go. All right, uh, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, this Culturama workshop uh, titled, let me get the title, Poetry is Personal and Poetry is Political. Um, thank you for uh, spending a little bit of your weekend with us. Um, that's that's very much appreciated. Um, I am Lloyd Aquino, uh, the current director of Culturama, uh, which has been going strong since uh, 2008. Um, and I'm also a professor of English. I teach uh, composition and creative writing poetry uh, at Mount San Antonio College. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce our uh, workshop leaders, and then I'll turn things over to them. Give me a quick second here. I have it all written out. There we go. Okay. So first we have uh, Mecca Sood, uh, who is an award-winning Asian American poet, author, editor, and literary activist from New Jersey. She is a literary partner with Life is Life in Quarantine, Stanford at Stanford University. Um, she's the author of the chapbook My Body is Not an Apology and full length collection My Body Lives Like a Threat. Uh, she blogs at uh, Mega's World site at uh, wordpress.com and tweets at, at uh, Mega, Mega Sood 16. And then we have Matt Cedillo, who has appeared on C SPAN and is featured in the Los Angeles Times, among other publications. He has spoken at Casa de las Americas in Havana, uh, Cuba at numerous conferences and forums, such as the National Conference on Race and, Race and Ethnicity in American, uh, in American Higher Education, and at over 100 universities and colleges, including the University of Cambridge. He is the author of the poetry collections, Mowing Leaves of Grass in City on the Second Floor, and his website is at mansadio.com. So I'm gonna turn things over to them, uh, and they're gonna guide you through this workshop. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Megha Sood, and uh, thanks, Professor Equino, for this kind introduction for uh, me and uh, my press mate, Matt Sidio. So uh, today we're going to do a poetry workshop, and the theme, as you can see from the name of the poetry workshop, which is Poetry is Personal, Poetry is Political, is centered on the social and uh, political issues. And uh, after uh, me and Matt, we are going to read some excerpts of our poems from our respective poetry collections. And then we are going to share some creative writing prompts with the attendees. And thanks so much for joining us uh, in this afternoon. And uh, then the attendees will get some time to read, write, and then they will get some time to read uh, in between the readings between me and Matt. And uh, anytime you guys, everyone is like welcome to ask questions in the prompts. And uh, if we will try to answer them to the best of our uh, ability. And uh, uh, before I start, I'd, I'd like to pass over to Matt Sidio if he wants to say anything, and then I'll start reading a few of my poems from my collection. Matt. Well, I, I'm just uh, I'm very excited to, to be here with everyone today. Um, I'm very uh, grateful to Professor Kino uh, for having us. Um, I've had, you know, wondered where I've, I've had an incredible time uh, working with, uh, with Lloyd, as well as uh, uh, predecessor John Branningham. Uh, and with the whole Mount Sac family. Uh, so it's been a really great honor. Um, and I'm very excited also to be reading with Mega Sue today. My, my press mate, uh, Mega, has done incredible things uh, all across the country, and really across the world, and even in internet, even into inter intergalactically. I mean, Mega has a poem uh, that, that was sent into space. So you're in for a real, real treat. Um, uh, Mega is really incredible, and I'm really glad to bring her to the West Coast here. So another, another, another foray to the West Coast via Zoom. So I'm um, very, very excited. Um, uh, to be here with you today, Mega. So, 
Thanks so much, Matt. You've always been very kind. Uh, so before I start, I'm going to just paste the run of the show in the chat, and uh, we'll try to stick to that uh, this throughout the workshop. And this is just a tentative suggestion for the run of the show. And uh, if anything changes five minutes here and there, I think we should be fine. So uh, before any delay, any further delay, I'm going to start reading from my uh, first full length poetry collection, which is called My Body Lives Like a Threat. And this was released by Flower Song Press uh, uh, in the month of January this year. And I've been on the book tour since then and every other event surrounding it. So the, the central emotion, the underlying emotion for this book is based on the body politics and the issues arising of the body politics and uh, such as like, like gun violence and reproductive rights violations and uh, sexual and uh, discrimination and all the other issues like how the body of a person is seen as a color, how the body of a woman is seen as a threat, how the body of a first generation immigrant is seen as a threat. So the 10, 11 poems that I'm going to read it basically encapsulates that issues. And uh, I'm going to start with the first poem, which is called Peace, a Metaphor for Denial. And this was the national level winner for the year 2020 by Poetry Matters Projects, which is a 23 years old organization based in Virginia. Peace, a metaphor for denial. <clears throat> Peace, an act of ignorance, an act of denial is not bliss no more when silence is gutted like a fish and the blood of your own fills the street how long can you be the puppet in your own peaceful country this act of abandonment speaks a muted language for all the hearts trapped like spirals on the other side of town the wall creates a boundary between me and humanity they are still considered illegal when one foot in my land, another bloodied and struck in the barbed wire that I put around God's own country. I was born with the privilege to call the peace of earth my own. No matter it is laced and seeped with someone else's blood, it belongs to me now. The young boy is shot. The pavement is stained by the color of his blood, dark and useless to the people of this peaceful country, those who pull out the armrest and the beach chairs to see the stars lit up the sky and the deafening noise muting the wails of a widowed mother. They sip the beer as cold at their souls, leaving the scene with a shrug and a short sigh. Ignorance is bliss. Peace is a metaphor for denial in this country I call mine. And the next poem is called, Does Hurt Have a Gender? And as you can see, the title itself poses a question to its listeners and its audience. Does hurt have a gender? What does a body want when it breaks down into a million pieces? It's pulverized existence wanting acceptance, only to be ignored and walked over left over like day old milk on the kitchen counter, forgotten and left to curdle. Why do we keep numbing the sharp pain, the knotted lamentation caught in our hungry mouths that cuts our soul both ways and leaves us to bleed in this world, profused with sweat and blood, a moment indescribable, leaking and soaking the ridges of the curbside, here the thickness of your blood, its viscosity and the gravitas of your feet depends on the color of your skin, a pain untenable. An insurmountable pain rising in my mouth, a dichotomy between pain and acceptance, a desire abominable. Do screams have a religion too? Do cries have a race? Does hurt have a gender? Do wounds have a nationality? Does your tongue curl into sin when you call out my name? Does the tripeness of your ideologies still mollify your pain? <clears throat> and the next ill called demarcation. 
and it was written in response as a reflection on the broken prison system of the United States of America. <clears throat> Demarcation. That frail evening marking the shadows of the long summer days, a bird perched on the barbed wires of the prison, demarcating happiness and the grief, acceptance and rejection, solitude and bouts of laughter, the prisoner and the free, the arresting hide of that boisterous wall whose bricks are soaked with the crackling wails and sobs of the broken souls neatly carved and plastered, a bizarre tinge of the ochre peeling off from the walls as the tears flow incessantly through blurry eyes as they gaze from emptiness to nothing. Silence curled and hollow bones rattling with rage. Palms holding out for someone, something, for forgiveness. A fleeting touch of humanity, a soft supple touch of love. A day wrapped around the promises of second chances silhouette of the loved ones appearing between the thick bars, a pleasant sight for the cracked and pale eyes. Death and silence are interchangeable. Go ask the bird as it sits at the barbed wire fence, keeping the two realms separate, a socially justifiable demarcation between the cacophony and the melody, the symmetry and the dissonance, between the pristine and the ostracized. How thin is the separation between love and acceptance, despair and the second chances, between judged and forgiven. And the next poem is from the section War and Peace from the book, and it's called Tourniquet, a snapshot of a war-torn house. <clears throat> a patch of green growing in the living room of a war-torn house. Leaves growing out of the cracks, the door unhinged, now lying asunder. Ceiling shredded into a thousand elegies to the blue sky, alone witness to the massacred shreds, torn thin as the promise of life, muted and dumbfounded. Sometimes it needs more than a lone promise of God in a home to heal. Sharpened with deafening silence, sorrow morphs and molds in its own ways. Death has its own language, a razor-sharp vernacular, a wailing widow in the streets. A half-broken frame of the window, unlaced with laughter, seeping into the cracked tiles of this house with sepia-tinged walls. Memories peeling off like a broken promise, left on the kitchen shelf to curdle. A tiny green patch growing through this broken house, healing with every sapling, every tiny leaf growing through the cracks, breaking through the pain. The next section is called My Body is Not an Apology. And this section is centered towards the, uh, the, the discrimination and the body politics the women has go, the women has to go through to the misogynist and living in a patriarchal society. And this is called even my grief should be productive. <clears throat> Don't let the aroma leave the pickle jar. Keep the lid tight, my granny used to say. Some things are better left unspoken. Part of your tradition, scream, but not too loud. Let the grief resonate with the inside of your skin. We are picked and chosen precariously through callous thick fingers. Make sure they are not rotten, not stained enough. The flavor doesn't come through well. I choose my memories precariously, not the rotten ones, the shuddering tooth. It should not shatter the patriarchy. Let the anger morph, let it turn into the vermilion shade, the symbol of pride and ownership. Use your pain wisely, let them own you well. I used those broken whispers as a guide to pluck the radishes out of, from the broken mud of the vegetable garden. Moistened and broken by the summer rains, crumbled in pieces, but always rich in bounty. With bended knees scraping my soft skin, I lowered myself, whitened by the heat of the summer sun, sweat and tears, inseparable. A perfect concoction of pain, a wicker basket, 
filled to the brim by the end of the day with the fruit of my labor, grief pulled out from the dearth of acceptance, menagerie of suffocated desires laid bare for your eyes, a lesson I have learned through the years that even my grief should be productive. The next poem is called False Ownership. This is strangely annoying when you see arrogance in someone who doesn't own a thing, can conjure a thing out of thin air, let alone a human being. You are just the renter here. You don't own shit. You are born from this womb that cradles your existence for months, a sliver away from called a being. Nothing but a pulsating existence in a foreign body. Sometimes the body treats it like an infection to keep away the contamination, self-purging and act of reclamation. Sometimes it accepts, cups its own palms, supports you, carries it to term. It's the body, the arrangement, the unsaid understanding, a solemn promise between the body and its identity. Your existence is slowly molded like a ball of sagging clay on the potter wheel morphed and molded to be called a human being. You don't own our womb. You definitely don't own our bodies. You break the arrangement, just like to possess the things. Let me clear this for the sake of your understanding. The body is not for your taking. There is a thin line between the choices we make and your wanting. The next poem is called Mouth, and it was written as an ode to the mouth, which I think it's like, it's a, it's, it's an entry point and it's an epicenter of gluttony and everything, which is the protagonist for the original sin. Mouth. A mouth is an entry point. It speaks of hunger, speaks of lust, the urgency of something more sacred than the hymn's underbuted breath. It speaks of the violence bodies endure, a gaping wound for a broken soul, an unspoken lexicon of silence, but misheard and misunderstood. Desires birth within it. Anything that catches our attention needs to be validated by our mouths, the epicenter of gluttony, the protagonist of the original sin. The desirous taste should sit well before we can call it our own. We call a lot of things our own. We desire, we possess the most untamed of all senses. A shiny trinket catches our attention and the slurping desire starts building. We are creatures of the mouth. We are creatures of wanting. The next is a short poem and it was written as an ode to all the writers where we are living such a vulnerable life, the writing itself is such a vulnerable thing where we put ourselves in front of everyone to be judged. And it's also an act of resistance, an act of catharsis, an act of putting out the emotions which are deeply seated in you. Resistance. I don't wait for you to corroborate my truth, evidence to prove the finality of my desires. I don't wait for your soft touches to smooth my scars, a tourniquet to stop this bleeding. I don't want you to comfort me in the middle of the night only to unravel my pain in the morning. As my body goes from a shade darker than yesterday, I don't need the assurance of the revolution around the corner. I birth my own revolution and I create my own marches the truth my soul owes to nobody but me. A conversation with my higher self, a divine evolution. When I resist, I create. And the next one is called My Body is Not an Apology. And as you can, and this was also the title of my chapbook and it's also included in the full length. And this poem was written in response to the toxic political environment and the body shaming and everything the women has to go through from generation to generations and how our body is nothing to be apologized for. 
and it is something it's like a it's it, it the poem itself is like a clarion call that that body is something it's it's our armor which shields us from all the trials and tribulations that we face in our life so we should never apologize for our bodies my body is not an apology this body my body is not an apology it's a prayer forgiveness wrapped in the filigrees end of my skin frayed at the ends battered for so long by your pointy convictions and cookie cutter rules that try to shape and mold this body along my body is not an apology it doesn't desire to fit in a frame mapped inch by inch else to be ashamed my body is not an apology it's a roar a declaration an unapologetic unabashed straight in your face truth a war cry a deafening scream from the silence my body is not an apology this body will not be mapped as a benchmark for beauty in attempt to hide crow's feet or the spider veins from your wild eyes or your forked tongue my body is not an apology but a safe haven an epitome of affection a metaphor for crimson love that flows in my veins for years to come my body is not an apology it's an eye of the storm a dance of destruction a safe haven for life forgiveness in disguise with love neatly folded in the wrinkles of my skin warmed oozing from every pore of my being a lesson etched in every single crow's feet forgiveness written through every inch of me this body is not an apology it is a profound lesson a triumphant proclamation an unfettered declaration and uh the last two poems i'm going to read the second last is called we all rise out of love and this basically brings out the fact that how food is an thing which connects us all and even if with, with our hyphenated identities and our like experience of a first generation immigrant and we all move across the world and how we carry our identities in the form of food right and how it brings out the love for our tradition we all rise out of love my tongue twists and turns trying to fit the cookie cutter in a land unknown the words put in my mouth like the small portions those scores made by warm supple hands of my mother as i gently wait for the next one her fingers always doused by the fragrance of bay leaves turmeric painted the various shades as she kneads the atta and dispenses life lessons in the kitchen on a warm summer day she taught me kindness comes from the heart but hunger pierces a man the most so learn to soothe hunger the lingering pain as she puts all her strength into kneading the atta into the doll of, of a milky moon my language is different than yours i try fervently to explain to my son who keeps correcting my pronunciation as i teach him the basics of love kindness and purity of heart sometimes i wonder how this world marred and demarcated by the boundaries those twisted pronunciations would look beautifully kneaded together like the lump of moon sitting in the copper clad vessel of my mother waiting to rise out of want and to close the reading i'm going to read the title poem of my full length which is called my body lives like a thread a wound opens its mouth and becomes self inflicting just like the night in its extreme vulnerable to a ray of light its existence challenged and yet it stands bravely unfettered by the challenges of the dawn as i catch the words in my mouth my language becomes an open threat my razor speech falling sharp on your dull convictions we always expose our deepest and softest parts to heal 
that's how the body learns to heal to grow to be vulnerable is an elegy for acceptance we have hunger written all over us with the ink as black as the mole on your shoulder challenging the frothiness of the moonlight my unspoken words words sit like a welt on my tongue in this foreign world every time i twist my tongue to shape a word i mispronounce your fear a new threat is born thanks everyone for listening and uh, now i would request professor akuno to put on the prompts uh thanks everyone for writing uh, comments in the chat i'm reading it uh, so as we can see that we have me and matt have created few prompts for this workshop and uh, uh, professor akino if, if you can move to the next page yeah so uh, this is a quote which i strongly believe in it's by uh, the writer poet and activist sonia sanchez and uh, she's one of my idols and all poets all writers are political they either maintain the status quo or they say something's wrong let's change it for the better so i personally think that poetry has been like a vehicle of social justice for generation and generation and it has the power to create that change and it has been doing so for years and years since the time of the revolutionary since the time of the women who marked worked for the reproductive rights violation for the suffragist movement and for the black lives matter uh that like galvanize the whole nation so i think the word we all and truly believe that the words have that strong power and poetry is basically something that like stimulates empathy and empathy is very necessary to achieve the uh the political and the economic justice in our society that we are living in so though as you can see that most of my poems are informed by the social issues that i was in like you know uh, it, exposed to while growing up in my home country which was india and also when i shifted my base to us i was exposed to a different set of uh, issues as a women of color as a first generation immigrant and uh, you know so all these issues have given birth to my first poetry collection so based on my experience and based on what have been my journey so far there are few prompts that i have like composed for the workshop uh, professor we can move to the next slide So here are some few prompts for the workshop today. Uh, write a poem in free verse or blank verse or any structured form, which can be sonnet, villanelle, haiku, chendru, haiben, any anything about the social issues which are affecting you most these days. You can write about the school shooting, climate change, gun violence, violation of reproductive rights, or even your experience as a first generation immigrant, if you are. write a poem from the opposing view of your belief system for example if you are pro choice write a poem from the pro life point of view and vice versa so this kind of second prompt will actually you know challenge and which give you the you know the perspective or understanding the other side of the aisle as they say you know you have to write from their viewpoint which is basically a challenge in itself because we all are very true and honest about our own belief system but but as living in a society which is already so politically divided we have to also understand the other perspective the other side of the aisle write a poem about the human condition and describe a moment that shook your faith during the pandemic and I, I, we all are coming out of the pandemic slowly we still part of the pandemic but i'm sure we all have some moment which shook our faith because we all has we all have been through that phase of you know we believe in uh, vaccination or we don't believe in vaccination believe in bear, wearing mask we don't believe so any such moment which shook your faith and you want to capture that in your poetry write a poem about one lesson the pandemic has taught you during your moments of isolation uh next page please and i would request matt to read and explain the prompts for the rest of the 
workshop. Write a poem about a social cause that is close to your heart and worthy and persuade others to join. Write a few paragraphs describing censorship. Include examples of how, when, and where censorship might occur. Is it okay ever to censor a book? Who has the right to censor a book? Is it ever okay for the government to censor its citizens? Is criticism the same as censorship? Can criticism be misconstrued for censorship? What is the difference between rules prohibiting certain speech inside a private residence or business as opposed to laws of the state that prohibit certain speech? And finally, think about the problems affecting our planet, such as climate change, global warming, plastic pollution, and describe in detail using vivid imagery about the ways in which it's affecting your home. Uh, so that's it. And uh, we would now request the participants to take like a 10, 15 minutes break and uh, they can write uh, and their writing can be based on any of the prompts which we have shared, or they can also write about any other issues uh, you know, with the catches the fancy or which is true to their hearts. So uh, we can start writing and uh, I think we'll like come back in like 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. I will also paste all the prompts in the chat. We will resume at 1.45 and uh, people who are writing can uh, switch off their cameras and mute.
five more minutes. It's just a gentle reminder of five more minutes.
it's 10 45 everyone uh so if everyone can switch back their cameras on and come back to the workshop So for the next part of the workshop, I, I would like to invite Matt Sidious to read some of the poems from his collection. And it's an honor and pleasure to share this space with Matt today. And uh, take it away, Matt. All right. So uh, uh, before uh, before I start, I want to share what I just wrote here. The 21st century islands of plastic washing the shore in the mist in the belly of whales, spaceship Earth filled to the brim, soil of toxin, soot that is rising, extinction on the horizon, a vanishing point of no return, maybe the late 90s, maybe the 1800s, maybe the microwave, maybe the aerosol can, may Armageddon be air conditioned, live streamed into living rooms, breathing filtered air, captured on the latest filters, the latest apps, why not go out with a bang, why not look your best, once in a lifetime, once in a species, mass extinction brought to you by the Fortune 500, brought to you by mass industry, Brought to you by the point of no return. Read the policy. So that's what I got. Anyways, all right. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a couple poems from uh, my two collections, uh, Mowing Leaves of Grass and City on the Second Floor. One more one. Three of them. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Sundown, Levittown, Fort Apache, Dirty Harry, John Wayne, Blackface, Minuteman, Moynihan, Gone with Wind, Breaking Bad. Washington Redskin, Confederate flag, the sword, the dollar, the cannon, the scholar, the cavalry, and the Ivy League history as written by lightning as the rising smoke of burning village. The ways in which victors keep their victims, a frontier thesis, some notes on the state of Virginia extraction, expansion, the winning of the West, Lewis and Clark, Smith and Weston. Now circle the wagon with bloodshed and slave sweat, the crack of the whip. The law of three-fifths, the crown republic of King Cotton, the intended failures of reconstruction, the housing covenants that greeted great migrations did the same to the Mexicans and poor Mexico. So far from heaven and so close to Monroe Doctrine. To Davy Crockett. To prison industrial complex, a war on drugs is a war on our young. Bloody Christmas. We for madness. 15 to life in four ounces, East Oakland. West Baltimore south of La Brea and all over north, Plymouth Rock, Jamestown, the Rio Grande, stolen lives, stolen land. This next one's called Pilgrim. See, some were born in summer homes in palatial groves, where pain was only to ever unfold from the pages of secret gardens where the red fern grows, but not I. See, I come from the stock of starred astronauts, a Greek the night sky, big dreams and wide eyes, always running down the devil's highway through occupied America, on the way back to us on Mango Street. And all the book for you to read. Where's a handball off the back wall of the Panaderia, born east the river post Mendez versus Westminster, one generation with red lines. And diplomas that were signed that those dreams with that skin need not apply. See, I come from struggle. And if my story offends you, it was only because you made the mistake of seeking your reflection in my self-portrait. See this, well, it's might not be about you. Because some are born of the common core. Respected faces grace the pages of doctrine discovered an age to be explored. World world hardships crashed against new shores, New England, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York for others, Pushed off Turtle Island, Aslan, do not call this brown skin immigrant. Child of the sun, son of the conquest, Mexicano blood, run through the veins of the east side of Los Angeles. Do not tell him it native tongue and song will best be sung. Do not tell me who I am, because I was raised just like you. Miseducating it's the most very same schools of lessons and legends of honest engines and Christian pilgrims and a nation of immigrants all united in freedom. That is until they pulled aside my white friend, pointed directly at me and said, Scott, I judge you by the company you keep. And you spend your time with this. And that same old story, 1846. The adventure of Uncle Sam, the stick up man, he wet back. Show me your papers, now give me your labor, the melting pot. 
was never made for the hands to clean it. The American dream has always come at the expense of those who tucked it in. You don't know that. So you don't teach it. Could write you a book, but you won't read it. So you know this is about you. And 1492, and the Treaty of Guadalupe and California missions and Arizona schools, these racists that try to race us as was their kids in cities that bear our names, which you can learn some today, from Ferdinand to Minuteman, from Arpaio to Alamo, from Popo Buddha, so to the Indian that still lives in need from 8 to 1643, trying to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. Can they mind? You know, strike the Pandala, Mr. Pada, Bakimirena, Azalitas, Brown Beresi, Zapatistas, Richard Nixon, through Napoleon, from Peckinpah to Houston, from Lone Star Republic to Prince. Christopher Columbus, all the way down to Donald and Trump. We didn't cross the borders. The borders crossed us. Who you calling immigrants, Pilgrim? That was Pilgrim. <laughs> and so um, these next two poems I'm going to do come from uh, um, City on the Second Floor. And uh, these poems are basically... Um, if, if, if mowing these grass is seen as kind of like an ethnic studies kind of a book and it's used in many ethnic studies courses across the country, including Berkeley and uh, Madison, uh, but also good places like East LA College uh, where, <laughs> where our people be. Um, but, uh, but this book's taught in ethnic studies course all over the place. This one's more of like a Marxist geography um, type text, more of a kind of where it's actually carried at Hensley Ingalls now, which is a, a bookstore that focuses almost solely on architecture. Uh, and they're actually carrying my poetry book. So that's, 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 you know, finding ways where poetry kind of doesn't go is kind of like my MO. Like, you know, so this is like an ethnic studies book. It's poetry, it's a collection of poetry, but it's really taught at like, you know, courses all across the country in Chicano studies. Uh, this was actually taught at, um, at San Jose City College, right alongside, uh, um, right alongside uh, Occupied America by Rudy Acuna, which is the quintessential uh, Chicano studies, like history book. So that's, you know, in many other places too, as well. So, anyways, and this the one's funny. The poem funny. that you read, Matt, could uh, what book is that in, and where could you buy it? This it's a, it's in uh, mowing leaves grass, mowing leaves of grass, and mowing leaves of grass. You can uh, get on Amazon. You can get at Target. You can get at Walmart. You can all those places. That's and, online. And or under, for me, under, under your name on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. No problem. So I'm gonna continue with reading now. With the, this poem here is called The Rich. Um, this is a persona poem, meaning this is not me. I've actually had people protest me while I was reading this poem before. They're like, we're going to rise up against you. And it's like, yeah, buddy, I'm a billionaire. And I came to this open mic in Pico Rivera to brag in all six of your faces. Now, <laughs> anyways, anyways, but anyways, this is uh, this is The Rich. Uh, it's a persona poem. It's not me. I do need you to purchase these books. Anyways, here we go. The Rich. I write in a three-act structure. We're going to get into a little more of that later when the, when the, when the, when the, when the prompt starts. Here we go. The rich. The rich. Well, they're not like you and me. They see an opportunity, they grab it. Reach for the stars and they put them in their pocket. The company stays in the red, but they're backed by the government. It's North Public Dimes aligns a pure profit, research and development. The rich, well, they'd even breed. Champagne wishes and caviar dreams, thoroughbred stallions, portable mansion, CD Porter Horizon, blood diamonds, golden parachutes, silicon messiahs, feasting on endangered species, served on silver platters, wind palaces, carved from the tips of icebergs, six figure charters, vulture capital, million dollar cufflinks, fucking life like an apple, insured by suicide nets, lifestyles of the criminally negligent, but you haven't lived. So you've launched a car in his face for no reason. And that's why I call freedom the rich way. Here's how it is. Dollars and cents, trademark and rent, facts and figures, lines on a ledger, derivatives and debt, building the future, increasing productivity, union busting back to the 100 hour work week, treating the fat, producing monopolies with real money, shorts and bets. That, my friend, so the rich stay rich while the rest make poor decisions in this pure ecstasy, living in the lap of luxury, pushing pharmaceuticals to the mark of the market, will bear your body to its altar at a life or death bargain, the gospel of wealth, because it is what it is, and that's all it's ever been. The less we spend, the more we keep. You see, the rich. And the poor will be just like you. Two hands, two feet, 
the sky, the sea, one heart that beats in the time to make the most of us who find no sympathy, reaching into these deep pockets. All we ever asked was for our fair share, and God damn it, that's all of it. We're on the streets, scream for peace and justice. We sleep in satin sheets, dream free and guiltless over oceans and tariffs, liquidating pensions that I'm to bid on porcelain and portraits at billion dollar auctions. You know you need us. You know we're selling your secrets. You know since those DNA kids watching the puppets on television to make freedom, free speech, fascism, democracy. We'll reach the earth and punch the ozone and fuel the economy with space stations. Your yes, space stations, I dream. Survive this lava pit. You got pots and pans. We got deeds and plans. Chopping down rainforests, colonizing the moon. We're the rich. Who the f are you? We'll privatize the water supply and then copyright the tears falling from your eyes. Burn it all down. What the hell are you talking about? The ice caps already melting. You want to start some shit? Eat the rich. We're already killing your kids. One carbon footprint, one gas house emission, one oil rig, one naval ship, one free trade. Agreement at a time we'll get away from it too. Nothing we say or do is ever held against us. Have you been paying attention? We're rich. All right. Um, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do one more from here, and then. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then we'll get, then we'll get, then we'll get to uh, maybe some of these writing prompts. Uh, this poem here I'm about to do is actually, uh, this actually poem was actually, um, was a part of an art exhibit. It's still going on right now. Or I think we had, we had a closing reception yesterday at uh, Plaza de la Raza in, uh, in Lincoln Heights, which is really cool because um, I, I was born in El Sereno. And so uh, my grandfather used to walk me over uh, to this park. Um, in, uh, in Lincoln Heights, uh, we just go, you know, we just go to Lincoln Park and really go to the, the to the to the art gallery. Um, but you know, there's an art gallery right there, the boathouse, um, and uh, and it was kind of a it's kind of a neat little experience because you know I've actually I've actually at this point in time I've been very fortunate uh, with this poetry to to really travel the world. I mean, I just got back from speaking at the University of uh, Napoli, the University of Florence. Um, like as mentioned, I've spoken at University of Cambridge also spoken at the uh, Casa de las Americas in Havana, Cuba. And as of about two or three weeks ago, I'm now the literary director of the Mexican Cultural Institute of Los Angeles. And uh, in the last week, I met with the Mexican consulate uh, of Los Angeles and the Mexican consulate in San Diego, um, putting together panels for shows at Sukkot in Tijuana, as well as the, the Guadalajara Book Festival. So I'm going to be traveling the world um, even more so than I already am. And so it's a real, you know, I, I never, I never take that for granted. I'm very fortunate. I'm very lucky to be able to do this. Um, but as much as all that meant to me, to be able to read um, less than a mile from where I was born and uh, to, at a place where my grandfather used to take me to feed ducks, um, that means, that means, that means more to me than, than all the Cambridges and all the Oxfords or Unams or whatever in the world. So anyways, this is a poem. This poem was part of the exhibit and I'm going to read it now. Called Hammurabi. I grew up on television, so my parents. I love Lucy lighter than sweetly. America's a red, a desire suppressed in separate beds. Censors rest assured everything in good taste, everything in its proper place. Every traumatic episode ends with the threat of Ricky's hand ever far from Lucy's face, beaming in glorious black and white, wrong and right. Plot lines shade out the gray of John Wayne's shining silver city on a hill of guns and butter, where every school child's desk doubles as bomb shelter, praying to the altar in question. So pledge your allegiance. Seal your documents and lock and load your freedom because it is not free. Now fall to your knees and praise be to the only God in which we trust. The atom, the Manhattan, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the nuclear family, nuclear testing, nuclear age gave way to nuclear waste. That's me. See, I grew up in the 80s, morning in America. Ronald Reagan and Mr. Belvedere fresh in my door telling me that life was more than mere survival. That I may live the good life yet when my time came, Homer Simpson Peter Griffin and Al Bundy were all lying in wait to convince me that I could raise a family in a two-story on the single income of a shoe salesman. They lied. And I cry. Not for myself, it's oncoming generation of iPad kids on the Hulu and Netflix where you pick your poison, but it rots your mind just the same. See them at cafes, it's sipping, job seeking, asking the net for deeper meaning. Who am I? Where do I belong? Of what use can I be? In days just these kids born go-go gadgets, wired, directed, 
to the, surf the net in search of themselves, no different. We will surf sway in the bells of the Catholic Church, place in holy writ, holy script, holy this, since the golden rule of pharaohs and Caesars, Romulus and Remus, Akbar and Alexander, Xerxes and Hammurabi, since the days of scribes and the books of kings, since they from on high convinced us down below that we ever needed their code of law to tell us we were free. Okay, so with that you said, um, why don't we get to, um, I guess this is the part where I, where I lead a little writing prompt, right? Is that what we're doing, Lloyd, Mega? I'm like the worst person I'm in the world, so this is, a, this, is, this is what I'm doing now. Okay, so I hear no answers, I will. I will uh, begin. Uh, are we sharing, or what are we doing now at this point? Uh, so I think we can like uh, give them like 10, 15 minutes more to write, and yes. then we'll share the works of the attendees. Okay. So you guys can like mute and turn off your cameras, and we will like come back at uh, 11, 15, 11, 10, and then. Uh, those who have written and wanted to share, remember it's a first draft. So we are, everything is like positive, constructive feedback. And uh, if you wish to share, you can share it. And we will come back after 10 minutes. So we'll be back at 11.10. Okay, so uh, as May said, uh, choose another one of the prompts and uh, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Yeah, and uh, as uh, asked by one of the listeners, uh, they want the titles to the chat. So I would request Matt to put the links of his books and I'll put the link of mine in the chat for anyone who is interested in buying. If anybody has any question, they can write in the chat.
two more minutes and then we'll start sharing. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys are inspired by the uh, readings from me and Matt, and we are able to ignite the love of poetry, which you already are pursuing as an undergrad. And uh, if anyone wants to share, uh, they can put their names in the chat or they can use the raise hand function of Zoom and uh, we will call them uh, one after the other. So is anyone ready to share their work? I uh, see Andrew's hand. Andrew Turner. Yeah, Andrew, please go ahead. Okay, I'll just read the first one I wrote. Walls close in around me again. Now accustomed to light, darkness and fear caress their tendrils soft, slippery, slither across skin, nerves, mind. I have not seen this before, but I have felt the cold, the burning hatred because I am different. Next on the chopping block, though my skin is fair and my gender correct, I am still not enough. Do not love the right people, think the right way, and that is enough to burn me at the stake. Let the ashes fall, taste the sweet chemical dust as rage crosses earth, parched for the past, a longing for something that should never have existed, a temporary blip of supremacy fading. Still, I will be gone in the end. Very powerful. And I love the word play, Andrew. Is there anyone next? I see uh, Shama Mahmood. Shama, you want to go next? Yeah, thank you. Um, I haven't titled this. <clears throat> I buy earrings, thin foil sparkle, clams and seahorses dangle at the aquarium in the blue hued light. The otters are outside besides a glass wall where the ocean funnels in, rushing to replace water in the tanks below. I think about how sharks in captivity never last, how SeaWorld transforms the gentle drowned man into a killer. I think about seeing crude oil snake its way across the glass, the film left behind, the scatter of creatures as it reaches for them. Purify this fishbowl arc with microplastics and prescription drug residue, like most, maybe this wall should stay an idea. I think of the National Geographic picture, a tiny tail grasping a Q-tip, washing oil off pelicans with dawn. I think of how we come here, watch the saddest show smiling, laugh when the seal claps on command. The way certain hands have ruined everything they touch, the way thumbs sophisticate us. These are not the same palms. Those who dive for pearls using their lungs as buoys only pass their hall to yacht owners to live, to make poor decisions. 
by another day of diving into a dying reef, just gray brown scarring the tourists, you know which tourists pay to break with their hands and take home in a Chanel suitcase. Imagine having a front row seat and still missing the point. Very powerful, Shama. And uh, I see uh, Robin. Robin, would you like to read? Robin, we can't hear you. I think your computer speaker is muted because I see you are unmuted. Maybe the... Uh, well, well, Robin looks at the uh, at uh, tries to fix your problems. Anyone else uh, care to read? Well, Robin looks into the technical difficulties. A zoom. Uh, I see Perla. Perla, would you like to read next? Robin, yes. Thank you. Oh, is Robin ready? No, unfortunately, no. Robin, okay. why don't you take the speaker off your uh, computer rather than the speaker icon of Zoom? Perla, you can you can start reading. I think she still is having problems, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much. This has been very helpful, and I struggle a lot with uh, language, as English is um, also my second language. And writing has always been a passion, but I just, um, you know, it's just so hard for me. Uh, but thank you all for hosting this piece. And uh, the first poem I, I wrote um, in this time is uh, My Body, My Choice. Is it though? For I come from a long line of mujeres who didn't have a choice. For I live in a community in which mujeres and queer youth don't have a choice. For I know way too many mujeres, queer youth, and children who didn't have a choice. For I have dwelled in organizing spaces in which mujeres, queer youth, children, and trans people don't have a choice. For I have not had a choice. And then I wrote another, a second one. It's very short. It's called My Choice. My body is sacred, yet disrespected. My choice is free, yet violated. My body is perfect, yet aberrated. My choice is mine, yet by force collaborated. My body is divine, yet colonized. My choice is clear, but I still shrivel in fear. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. I love the alliteration and the rhyming scheme that you have like maintained throughout the poem and it flows beautifully. Uh, I see next is Linda. Linda, would you like to read? <laughs> <laughs> I hate doing this, but I'm, I'm forcing myself. Okay, we all have something to say. Yes. That's my first line. <laughs> The birth of an opinion is complex. It comes from the gut, shaped by beliefs, values, and experience. There is no life devoid of hypocrisy. So I get it. Within the universe of each individual who walks this earth, there are opposing forces. The good cop, the bad cop, sitting on the shoulder. So we latch on to one side of an issue hold it tightly, push an opinion to influence friends and family or sound off on social media. For me, I'm beginning to watch Fox News alongside CNN. I have become curious on what makes both sides tick. 
how the passions get finagled into a stand. I see the ambiguity, the overlap between the two extremes, the scorching diss of the other side, the hypocrisy of both. And just before I drift off to sleep in my bed, I find myself exploring, blending the two differing agendas and principles. The in-between has led me to bliss, but I'm still a hypocrite. I loved it, Linda. <laughs> I love the way you have like, you know, addressed the ambiguity and, you know, the, the hypocrisy of both the sides. And that's true. That's true, right? The, the toxic, uh, the political environment, and it comes from both sides of the aisle, right? It, it, it's not from one side. So it's, that's why it be, I always urge to people, you know, to understand where the other person is coming from before you're too much, you know, solidifying your opinion that you can't even hear the other side of the story. So yeah, it was a beautiful poetic Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, you. Robin, uh, did you figure out? Can we hear you now? Oh, we still can't hear you. Oh, that's a shame. Is there anybody else who wants to uh, share their response to the prompts or anything that, that they have written? Yeah, Robin, if you try uh, leaving the Zoom and coming back, it might help. Somebody suggested in the chat. Yes, Fiona, there is time. Uh, we have uh, eight to 10 minutes more. You can read if you want to. Thank you. Um, uh, this is obviously a really rough draft and doesn't have much imagery in it yet. <laughs> so um, no I, tend, I tend to write kind of the concrete stuff first and then add on other stuff later. Um, it's about being disabled in the pandemic. In the end, it took two weeks for the world to change completely. After years of us asking for ways to work and dance and vote, to take part in support groups or parties or politics, after years of being told it was impossible and unworkable, it took two weeks for the world to change opening like a sunflower out of darkness and amongst all the fear and the preparation, because we always knew we'd be most at risk, the world began to shift, delivering more than just the basics. We could finally be part of the world with cocktails and meals, meds and communities. We finally got to take part in conversations instead of being filled in later. We could take workshops from bed, go to parties with a cat beside us, fight for our rights and meetings, work like everyone else. We could celebrate pride, get therapy, go to sport groups. We spent so many years living in the edges, watching through bedroom windows and TV screens, talking only to other people as isolated as us. So many years, choosing between the pain and the payoff. And as scared as we were, as much as we ached for everyone hurting, we allowed ourselves to wonder if this might be the change. People talking so openly about how hard it was to be stuck inside for a month, how much they missed everyone, how much they wanted to be part of things. We wondered if maybe they could imagine years of that, decades alone without Zoom or working from home wondered if they'd notice how many more people came to their meetings. These new people, queer kids who'd never been to Pride, survivors who'd never been able to get help, activists who'd never made it to a march. So much to say, they had so much to give. We wondered, hoped, that maybe learn flexibility was always the answer. We were always here, and just needed them to open up. We hoped once it was done, our lives would be less constricted. But the bodies piled up, most of them disabled, and people got angry with the access. And here we are now, where they refuse even the smallest accessibilities, refuse masks to keep all of us safe, shut down the Zoom meetings, 
So the few places we could go before are now too unsafe for us. Even now, everyone should understand how we live. Our world somehow got even smaller. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. It's very beautiful and it's very moving. I mean, it, it speaks a lot about the, the prompt, right? The lesson we had learned during the pandemic. So pandemic has given us like perspective to like, you know, to come across from a more like a point of empathy towards people, right? And if we did not learn that lesson through the year of bias, which has come back after 100 years, I don't know what else is needed for the human beings to have empathy towards other people who are going through the similar situation. So it's, it's a very beautiful, it's a, it's a moving form. Thanks so much for sharing with us. And uh, I don't see any hands up, but if you are interested in sharing your work, it's just a first draft, please be brave. Oh yeah, I see Liz hands up. Okay, uh, yeah, Liz, do you wanna, uh, Robin, sorry, Robin, can you say something? I cannot hear you. Hello. I can hear hey. Liz now. Oh, <laughs> is somebody else going? I, we are just trying to get Robin to, I am so sorry, Robin, we can't still hear you. Uh, it, are you comfortable enough to like paste your uh, poem in the chat? If anybody else have any suggestion how to fix Robin's problems, please share with us. It's a technical problem, yeah. Robin, we have to we have to again put you on hold. And uh, Liz, can you come back and share with us? The war dogs are barking in the back benches at Westminster. The front ones used as loungers for ill-bred scroungers with double barrel names. Inconceivable, unbelievable, these peevish specimens shivering with tails between their legs get to say how we should live our lives. The whole howling pack of them, stomachs growling for the next tea break, fine din dining all day long, whilst nurses, teachers, children live on the breadline, scratching for a mug in soup kitchens. Free food has a price, but given pride of place when charity has to patch over disparity in wealth, health, it's not a nice taste to have wages so low they break you. But these top dogs in their ivory lairs shower the world with vice, whilst us mice scurrying in a hurry to dine on dying, crying, trying to apply a living in a loveless hell. These mongrels, curs, bitches, stitch us up. They spurn the opportunity to do something decent for the community. They act with impunity, think paradise papers, think offshore for more money than they can wrap their fetid, stinking bodies in. They never learn, gurning to cameras, social media sound bites makes them all right. Propaganda slogans, they've become feudal shoguns. Whilst the country burns, Brexit, pandemic, demonic, monarchic mischief of little princes not towing the line, or even the first after her mummy who must be obeyed, watches them stumbling in slime as she cuts cake. No one blushed with shame in a platinum jubilee. Why is so much money spent wasted on pomp and ceremony in this uncommon era where the common summons gladiators, doggy gladiators in stilted political stadium dumbs and numbs us to death. The tedium where the canines dream of chasing broken birds, hunting, sensing the blood of others, all breeds present, correct, all wanting to be top dog as the pup, but as the pups must bow, roll over, show tummy neck, tummy consumed with wine, stomachs full of foie gras about to burst. The good ones so rare, they are delicacies, but I have hardly seen one in this lifetime. They think they are arena fighting for life and the right to feather line fat pockets bursting at the seams. They take second homes, second jobs without a blink. Some consider it their right to buy a tree house for a child, the price of a small house, the everyday man dreams of owning. Imagine 150,000 pounds sterling of our hard earned cash nearly gone on a pad for a two-year-old. Then imagine wall-to-wall -wall inelegance spread about that number 10 tat, gaudy as a bawdy house in bygone eras, even though they do exist today. Look, look, read like a book, really look at Parliament. 
a pox on both your houses, a pretense of meritocracy, but as backwards as a shady cacistocracy, nepotism, cronyism, authoritarianism, every schism and ism alive thrives in these flabby, chubby, grubby, greedy, seedy. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, great. Liz, Liz, where are you joining us from? I'm in the West Country in, in, uh, in England. Liz? Jane, Jane Austen country. Liz, Selena would be very proud of you. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, who's that? Yeah, that was wonderful, Liz. Um, Marianne. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Marianne. Oh, Serena. Yeah, Selena. Thank you. I think uh, we can hear Robin again. So, Robin, can, like is that better? Yeah, that is better now. So, I ended up signing in on my phone and just forgetting the computer. No, I will go now. Death rains from gunfire. Blood stains Woodstock butterflies. All is red today. All is red today. Cowardice makes tragedy in our great divide. Yep, that is absolutely true. Cowardice makes tragedy. You know, the strength to stand up for yourself and the, the more is the strength to stand up for somebody else and that's what gives us the essence of being a you know social being so uh, i think we're all almost reached the end of the workshop and if there anybody else who wants to share uh i don't see any hands up and uh, i would like to thank all the attendees for joining and sharing their creativity with us uh, i would like to pass this on to matt if he wants to share any words about the the beautiful poems that we have just heard. Matt, on to you. Yeah, no, I, oh, thank you, thank you, Mega. I mean, again, I want to sort of reiterate um, my appreciation to Kalsa Rama. I want to appreciate, uh, reiterate my appreciation to Mega uh, for joining us and definitely for, for leading this workshop. Um, I was very, uh, very excited about the opportunity to do this. And I was very, very um, impressed by all the poetry shared here today. Um, this is incredible, and it's really incredible the reach of Culture Rama that we have people joining from England. So I want to again congratulate um, not only everyone for sharing their wonderful poetry day, the very moving poetry day, but also um, the whole uh, team at, at Mount Sac uh, for putting together something that um, is really is really stretching far, far beyond um, you know how it originally started, you know, which was just like kind of a local writers weekend thing, and and it's really you know the the the, the, the scope has uh, year after year expanded and expanded and expanded. So I want to congratulate the team. And, uh, and I also want to say thank you um, as well for including me. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. All right, uh, thank you so much to everybody for, uh, for sharing all of your amazing and insightful and thought provoking and moving poetry. Uh, thank you to, to Mega and Matt for, for leading this workshop and giving us some, some really great prompts even for after this workshop. Uh, I'm putting in the chat really quick, our uh, Culturama blog. Um, and if you would like to watch uh, the, vi the video of this workshop again, uh, it, should, uh, it should be up on the blog. Uh, by the end of, uh, by next weekend, excuse me. Um, we're probably going to take the month of August off for Culturama uh, as we're getting prepared for uh, everything that's going to be happening in the fall. Uh, but just, uh, you know, uh, stay in touch, uh, be on the lookout for anything, uh, er anything and everything that will be happening in the fall. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all again. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, I'll see you all again, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. so much, Thank Professor X. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Mega. Oh yeah, I was just waiting for everyone to leave, so I just can thank you again. Oh sure, sure. Um, um, and oh, uh, I just forgot to like put a link. I I've been like selected one of the judge for a spoken word competition in New York. It's okay. 
artist forum it's a 23 year old organization and they have like they host this so this year they've chosen i'm one of the jury so i'll send you the link yes and, uh, if anybody interested they they host competition in various genres in photography in choreography in, oh, wow. okay. and in spoken word so i am one of the judges for the spoken word this year okay uh, the, the deadline is unfortunately july 19th but based on the response if i ask they'll give us an extension okay so i'll i'll just send you an email with the link absolutely and- i'll share all the on my social media and and uh, as well as i can so yeah absolutely the well, thanks so much again for giving me this opportunity yeah thank you thank you and have a good weekend you too bye bye <laughs>